in Sydney, it's um, it's in the evening, but at 14 hours off Eastern time. So that would make it uh, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night. 11 o'clock. I think it's 11 o'clock. Yeah. Recording in progress. Okay. Did you blip her a message, Sam? Um, I did an hour and a half ago and Andrea did, did as well. I'll, I'll send her one. Um, she's. Ah. And yeah, we um. got her. Um, no. There are a lot of screens with without people. These are uh, members of the technical uh, team in, in Jakarta, Wendy. Okay, fantastic. Welcome to all of you. I hope uh, you <laughs> enjoy it. <laughs> you almost have one member of staff per speaker, right? <laughs> wow. Um, it's an amazing setup, Andrea. It's just incredible <laughs> what you've done. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, all the credit to the Jakarta team, really, who are behind all the technical um, organization of the Congress. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not. I'm not sure what you want to do. Is um, nine o'clock. Um, exactly right now we, sh we, sh we should wait another ahead. minute no we should we just should go, go ahead, ahead and and uh, i mean she's she's very flexible and she can go last or she'll go in the right order uh depending on when she joins uh, okay excellent so uh, very briefly um you are the chair uh, sam so you will be able to manage the chat the questions will come through the chat only they will not be verbal questions Okay, if you are sharing, if you are uh, sharing slides, you will be able to control that yourself by sharing the screen. Okay, um, and with that said, I think I'm handing over to Ola. Ola, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Andrea. Can you hear me? Okay, so um, good evening from Jakarta. We are now about to start the webinar, just some housekeeping notes to add to what Andrea has mentioned. We will open the Zoom um, in a minute, and then we will start with a just a small countdown to make people aware that the webinar is starting. We'll have a short uh, bumper video, and then there will be annou an announcer that will announce the chair, and then after that, the chair can start and kick off the session. I hope um everything will run well so good luck and have fun thank, thank you very much one more thing to mention sorry is that you will only be able to see the number of participants once we've gone uh we've opened yes so uh the number of participants you see here doesn't say anything okay good luck bye bye Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the What Should an Economist Know session. Without any further ado, please welcome our chair, Mr. Samuel Balls, to open the session. Mr. Balls, the screen is yours. Thanks very much uh, and welcome everyone to our session, um, What Should an Economist Know? Uh, we'll, uh, uh, I'll introduce the speakers in just a minute. Uh, but uh, first about the, the topic. Of course, the question evokes the kind of thinking that you can trace back uh, to Thomas Kuhn and his structure of scientific revolutions, where he said that what we expect a good undergraduate major to know is what we would call the paradigm of a field. Uh, we're raising that question, although perhaps not in the way that Kuhn would have done. 
Wendy and I this past year have spent a lot of time trying to figure out if Kuhnian paradigms really happen in physics and other fields. We're not sure they do, but in economics, it could be the case. Uh, we're very happy to have here um, Wendy Carlin, who will be presenting some joint work with me, uh, Jean-Paul Carvalho, uh, who is at the University of Oxford, uh, incorrect on the, uh, on the poster there, uh, Pauline uh, Grosjean, uh, at University of New South Wales and Eric Maskin uh, at Harvard. Uh, they will each uh, speak for 10 minutes uh, in that order and then um, we'll have a discussion. I will of course be li listening to the chat and I'm sure there'll be lots of interesting comments. We won't have time for all. Uh, and so um, again, welcome everyone and Wendy over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Sam. I'm just gonna share my screen. Great, so uh, it's, it's very good uh, to, to welcome everyone to our session. And I think there are people here from all over the world. So the first thing that I would like you to do is just to conjure up in your mind, uh, you're sitting in front of an audience and you say to them, uh, you say to your audience, what comes to your mind when you, you, you talk about economics? Use your arms or your hands to express something about economics. And I almost certainly bet that if you do that, what your audience will do is to go something like this, or like this. So they will convey the idea of, uh, of a clearing market. And uh, that takes us to this black and white picture here on the left-hand side, which is of, um, of a student swatting for her exam in 2019. It's kind of in black and white. Um, and she has that, those ideas in mind. So uh, the, the concepts of supply and demand, this clearing market idea. We skip across 2020 when exams were canceled. And by the way, um, when we would have been uh, enjoying ourselves uh, in the Congress in Bali, and we move along to 2021 and see uh, a student again um, preparing for exams. There are a very different set of concepts in the mind of the student preparing for the exams after this year that, uh, that, that every, every one of us are, around the world has experienced. And what, uh, what I want to do, um, re reflecting on the work that Sam and I have been doing, is to, uh, to, to draw out from this contrast uh, an answer to the question of what an economist should know. So the next, the next little exercise that I'd like you to do in your mind is to um, uh, uh, think about putting this before your class, your very first class of the next teaching session. Ask them, what's the most pressing issue that economists should address? So just think in your mind what they would be likely to say. And this, what I'm going to show you is the results from uh, over three and a half thousand students, um, the, the results they gave in 2020. So what was on the minds of the students in terms of what they thought we as, a, uh, as economists should be addressing, uh, really dominated by the concept of inequality. But you can also see their climate change, sustainability, and COVID-19 and its effects uh, also very much on, on their minds. Uh, one thing we, we you know, if we're, if we're trying to answer this question that Sam kind of posed uh, initially uh, in terms of paradigm changes, is to think about when that might have happened before. And we can think back to Paul Samuelson, uh, his, his work on uh, his text on economics published in 1948. And he was trying to change what an economist should know at that time by bringing into the, uh, the you know, changing the benchmark, bringing to the front of the book, the economics of Keynes and the analysis of national income determination. And what he was saying is that this wasn't just coming out of the blue just because we had a new problem. There was uh, methods of, um, uh, there was economic theory available. So he said the methods of analysis used in his text are those that have been employed by most of the active academic economists under the age of 50 over the last decade. And a question we want to ask is whether that's true of the, the situation in which we find ourselves now facing a very different set of problems. 
our answer is basically yes. And let's just take a few of those problems and think about the, the new concepts that we should uh, that we would have to bring in to what an economist should know and, and the sources in the research literature that are available. So here we can see in terms of wealth creation and innovation, new concepts like Schumpeterian rents, uh, increasing returns, the creativity of the market and so on. For environmental sustainability, then it's obviously non-market social interactions that matter. Uh, other regarding preferences are going to be necessary for uh, the kind of problems that we face. With inequality, then we have to bring in concepts of economic rents, of power. And for unemployment, then uh, incomplete labour and credit uh, contracts will be essential. And there's a body of research there. For financial instability, um, we have to think about uh, the role that prices play as information the dynamics of price setting and the role of positive feedback processes uh, and, and, and tipping points. So um, our, our basic argument is that we do, have, we do have the goods to move towards a new set of what an economist should know. And so let's uh, just contrast the existing canon with what that new benchmark might consist of. For one thing, uh, what people are like is going to be very different in the new benchmark as compared with the conventional one. So where people are thought of as homo economicus, far-sighted, self-interested, we have to add to that cognitive limits, identity and other motives, you know, ones other than, uh, than self-interest. Uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, information, then uh, since it is often incomplete, asymmetric, and non-verifiable, then what that means is that we can't draw up complete contracts to cover the uh, interactions between uh, uh, people in the economy. So we have these incomplete contracts and, and missing markets. In, uh, uh, if we turn to technology and competition, then uh, the new benchmark has got to bring in endogenous technology. Uh, we have to be thinking about a world in which returns are constant or increasing so that we have, uh, we often have decreasing costs. And competition, instead of playing this role, um, it, its role in the, in the conventional benchmark of uh, being perfect competition among price taking agents in these kind of markets, uh, and the, the, the famous result that this is what ensures Pareto efficiency, we have to move to a different notion of competition. Uh, we have the, if you like, the Hayekian perfect competitor who's actually rent seeking. And this uh, is crucial for explaining the dynamics in the economy. The dynamics indeed are very different. Uh, some problems are well characterized by a self-stabilizing economy around a unique equilibrium. But for other problems, dynamics really matters. We have to bring in uh, instability and the selection among multiple equilibria, if we're going to be able to address uh, many of the problems that we face. In, in the standard way of, uh, of uh, thinking about the economy, then the sort of heterogeneity among uh, economic uh, agents is thought of in terms of them being different in their preferences, different facing different budget constraints, and kind of uh, really centrally focused on buyers and sellers. But in the new benchmark, uh, we have to think about people differing because they have, they have asymmetric positions in the economy. An employer really is different from an employee. Lenders are different from borrowers. And that takes us to uh, uh, broadening the concept of power so that we're including the principal's power over an agent in these key markets. And whereas rents were basically an inefficiency um, and they originate in, in mistaken public policy in the conventional benchmark or because there's limits on competition. In the new, uh, in the new benchmark, then uh, rents are also essential to making the economy work. They provide the incentives to innovate, to work hard, to use borrowed funds prudently and to equilibrate markets. The result of this is that we obviously have to broaden the cast of characters from whom we draw in, uh, in, in building 
the new knowledge in, in, in economics. So what are the implications of this? The implications from incomplete contracts is that we're using these principal agent models. We have non-clearing labor and credit markets in equilibrium and that private power between these different uh, actors and social norms met, matter for equilibrium allocations. In such a model, inequality, remember that great giant inequality is the problem that students highlighted. Inequality is built in because of the differences in endowments of principles and agents, uh, as well as via price setting. If we've got increasing returns, then we've got market size effects, we've got winner take all competition, and we have to pay attention to dynamics. If we put these three things together, then uh, a, a, an interesting implication is that it is giving us the promise of an integrated theory that supersedes the micro macro dichotomy. And uh, as well, it requires uh, economists to use it insights from other disciplines. It's not just like an optional ex extra, but if we're talking about people in a different way, if we're talking about their interactions, then we have to bring in the insights from psychology, so sociology, political science uh, as, as a necessity. This is true as well of uh, the role of social preferences, and that's gonna take, take us to a political economy that goes beyond the selfish individual voter. We think that a new benchmark along these lines is, is, is in the making, that it can address the, the, the pressing uh, societal challenges that the students are, are concerned about. And moreover, it actually can be taught to undergraduates. And that's something that we're doing in the context of the core project. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Wendy, uh, for that presentation and for keeping to the time. Uh, Jean-Paul, uh, looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Be sure to unmute yourself. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Sam and the IEA, for inviting me to speak today and um, to my esteemed fellow panelists. Um, what economists know, uh, what I'm going to say is something that's very simple and actually contained within what Wendy was already saying. Um, I'm going to place it in a historical context and then give you an example of how, if economists know more about this particular um, connection between economics and other fields, then um, we can make some progress in understanding some of the contemporary problems that we face in the US and elsewhere. Um, okay. Let's go back to classical economics. Classical economics emerged amidst an economic and social revolution, what John Hicks uh, described as the rise of the market, both the rise of the market economy and market society. The political economy, as it was known, was uh, understood that economic behavior was situated within a social and political context with behavioral mo motivations such as empathy and esteem figuring heavily and history casting a shadow. So even if we go to Marshall's principles, in the first two paragraphs, we have this, Marshall comments on political economy, um, some outdated language, of course, but it is on, on the one side, a study of wealth, and, and on the other and more important side, a part of the study of man. For man's character has been molded by his everyday work and the material resources, which he thereby procures, more than by any other influence, unless it be that of his religious ideals. And the two great forming agencies of the world's history have been the religious and the economic. So this was this, this um, more holistic approach to the study of economic and uh, economy and society was there from the beginning in economics. But in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, there was a mathematical, it was a very fruitful application of mathematics to markets. But this led to a focus on harder problems and the neglect of softer ones, as George Akerlof has described. Uh, he describes these as sins of omission. I think these sins began as somewhat minor ones, but have become worse over time, as, as I will um, make clear. The, the Mathematical turn and its procession down a narrow path, focusing on markets, went unchallenged because it was so fruitful, but also because of the two sides, the economic and the social, were moving in lockstep. 
The Industrial Revolution caused massive social dislocation and, and alienation, which has been described by Marx and Engels, by Durkheim and Polanyi and others. But nevertheless, it was not a narrow phenomenon purely of rising real incomes. It was a more holistic um, phenomenon in which uh, literacy, life expectancy, heights, caloric intake, and much else rose in conjunction with real GDP. Fogel, Bob Fogel, has described this as a technophysio revolution. So hence, econ economics could proceed down the narrow path in the faith that a, a lot of the other things in the social sphere will be taken care of by the accumulation of wealth. But I think this is becoming clear that this is no longer true, that this connection is no longer automat automatic and inextricable. For example, in the US in 2015, from 2015 onwards, life expectancy has begun to decline, driven by the depths of despair that, that are described by Case and Deaton in their recent book. In addition, there's been a mental health epidemic, especially depression and anxiety, which is constant amongst the richer, more developed countries. Can economists shed any light on what is going on? Is this independent of economics? Well, I would argue not. Though we've taken a kind of reductionist approach, reductionism is necessary as part of social science. Universities are organized in this way. For example, we have separate departments of chemistry and biology, we have separate departments of economics, soci sociology and political science. Um, so reductionism is, is necessary, but it is useful only insofar as the, the connecting information between the different components is not lost. And this is something that is reiterated by my um, esteemed colleague, Don Sari. So what should economists know? Well, I think economists should know this connecting information. That is, the, they need to understand the interaction between, what, between economics narrowly defined and social structure, including things like social norms, culturally transmitted beliefs and preferences, social identities. We need to understand the social ecology in which economic behavior takes place and which markets operate. And in doing so, we will return to a broader conception of economics as political economy. Now, economics has expanded in scope over the last 20 years. Many subjects are acceptable um, subjects of inquiry that were not um, even 20 years ago. And there's been some measure of success, but much more serious work needs to be done. Many of the people on this panel, I think I'm fortunate, um, um, have made some of the greatest contributions uh, in advancing this agenda, actually. Let me provide an example. This is uh, rather abstract. Let me provide an example of how adding the missing connection between the economic and social spheres can improve our understanding of contemporary problems. Okay, let's consider again the deaths of despair among middle-aged whites in the US due to suicide and drug and alcohol abuse. What Case and Deaton show is that these deaths are concentrated among non-Hispanic whites without a college degree. What they attribute these deaths to is the functioning US health system and the shift in market and political power from labor to capital through rent seeking. Now, while these factors no doubt play a role, I think there's something more fundamental going on here that is at the intersection of the economic and social domains and something that is a natural consequence of the US system of meritocracy, which can be missed if you are purely seeing these domains as separate and independent. So economic mobility, which is the hallmark of the meritocracy, contemporary meritocracy, sorts people based on certain traits that are conducive to expressing or achieving merit, socially separates them into classes, and thus alters peer effects and other social ex externalities within classes. This is what I call the sorting separations externality mechanism and something I analyze in a forthcoming paper in the Journal of Institutional Economics. This connection, the SAC mechanism connects economic and social outcomes in an important way and it's important for understanding what's going on in the US. 
In the US today, elite positions are allocated based on education, which requires one to sit patiently and do well in examinations over long periods, sometimes the entirety of one's youth. This is parallel to the Confucian system of meritocracy, which dates back to the sixth century BC. And this is that, that was something that inspired the enlightenment thinkers and their conception of meritocracy. Because of this, I believe that the education and selection into the elite sele selects for certain non-cognitive traits, such as patience, self-control, conscientiousness, rule following, conformity, etc. And this is a point that's been made by Ed Hopkins. The key is that these traits are also associated with better social outcomes, more healthy social behavior, including lower levels of alcohol and drug addiction. Thus, economic mobility selects based on traits that have social implications and therefore creates polarization in social outcomes between classes. The college educated experience better social outcomes, they're not, they're called, they're, those without college education experience were social outcomes. Moreover, that's a selection effect. Moreover, if the two classes are socially separated, peer effects and other externalities can amplify this polarization, adding a treatment effect to the original selection effect. So this is what I set out in this paper. Uh, I present a model of this SEC mechanism to show how economic mobility not only leads to polarization with, um, between classes, but it can also, act, it can also exacerbate worsen aggregate social outcomes when externalities are convex, you know, defined, precisely defined in the paper. Um, and that's what we see in the US today. Moreover, they, they, this has dynamic intergenerational implications. Consider a caste-based society. There is no mobility, hence no selection on any traits. Traits may be well mixed in the population. When you permit mobility, the transition out of the caste-based society creates a, a burst of um, economic mobility. As members of the non-elite with the meritorious or favored traits get educated and enter the elite. However, if these traits are passed down within economic classes, say through families or schools, through cultural transmission, then the favored traits are rare in the next generation of the non-elite. Hence, fewer members of the non-elite get educated in the next generation. And in this way, you get a dynamic meritocracy devolving into a static class-based society. So I set this all out in this paper and um, it's something I think that is a fundamental connection here between the economic and social spheres, a fundamental consequence of economic ability. And a lot has been written recently about the meritocracy, a lot of great work, but I don't see this, um, uh, this connection mentioned there. And so I think this is one, just one illustration of how um, incorporating this connecting information between these two domains, which can be, which traditionally, at least until recently, have been seen as separate by economists, um, can improve our understanding of, econ of important economic phenomena and contemporary problems. Thank you very much, Jean-Paul. Uh, uh, there's an amazing amount of overlap between uh, your ideas and the ideas that Wendy uh, uh, put forth in your example that beautifully illustrates the kind of work that uh, needs to be done. Um, Eric, uh, can, can you um, go ahead? Um, we're, we're anxious to hear your views. Sure. Um, let me get my slides up. Yeah, they're there. Great. You could even- Well, I, uh, in, in trying to answer this question, uh, what should an economist know? I, I took a somewhat different task from the other panelists. I was um, thinking about what skills economists mm -hmm. should have rather than what particular pieces of uh, knowledge uh, they should have. And I decided that perhaps the most fundamental skill that an economist should have is uh, figuring out how to formalize intuition. Uh, we all have these vague, uh, perhaps not very well worked out ideas about economic life. Uh, and what an economist does is to take 
these intuitions and turn them into a model uh, in which the intuition holds. And I think there are at least three important reasons why uh, the ability to model is crucial to what an economist does. First, uh, well, if you can't produce a model, that suggests that perhaps the intuition is wrong. That, that is, it, it may sound superficially plausible, but there may be something internally inconsistent about it. Uh, but even if it is right in some sense, um, it may not always be right. And one, one value uh, that a model confers is it, it gives you some idea of the circumstances in which the intuition is valid. Say, so Eric, uh, Eric, Eric, um, yes. I, I have a note here on the chat. Somebody says we cannot see the screen. So uh, maybe I'm oh. asking the IT staff in Indonesia, can you check to see if there's a problem? It may be that you're not full screen, although that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, no, I think uh, I am full screen. But, you but are, actually, okay. I, actually, I don't think that it's critical that people see the slides. Uh, they, they, they may add a little, but I think I can, I can adequately convey oh, this. Or okay, so, we, we, have, so don't we have many. So, yeah, we, we're all set in that there are many chats saying, yes, they see the slides. It, may, it just must, must have been an idiosyncratic problem. So sorry okay. for the interruption, Eric. That, that's on. fine. Uh, so uh, I was suggesting that there are these three reasons for producing um, models. Uh, the third reason uh, is that, after all, we economists need to communicate with one another. And the way that we communicate is typically through models. Uh, uh, if you're not able to produce a model to express your intuition, even if the intuition is right, then you're probably not going to get that across to your colleagues. There, there, there are other reasons as well. Models allow you uh, a basis for, uh, for quantification. If you want to measure, uh, the various variables that go into a, a model, uh, you need some formal structure even to talk about measurement. Well, let's, let's look at an example of this uh, and a, a very old intuition uh, going back to, uh, to Jevons, if not earlier, is that uh, and a, 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 a critical role of money is as a store of value. Uh, and by, by that, I mean that a person can transfer his or her wealth through time. Uh, this, is, this is the sort of intuition that is obviously true, at least sometimes, uh, because we see people transferring wealth through money. Uh, but... Uh, under what circumstances is the intuition true? And, and, and for that, we, we, um, we need to look a little bit more closely. Well, most models that economists create have a finite number of periods. In fact, usually just one. Uh, but interestingly, the intuition about money cannot be true in a finite period model. Uh, and that's, if, if you think about it for a minute, that's pretty clear. Uh, if there's a last period, no one is going to be willing to accept money for goods in that last period because they won't be able to spend the money subsequently. There is no subsequent period. Uh, so that means that no one will be able to buy anything with money in the last period because no one will accept the money. And if we, now we can work backwards, no one will accept money for goods in the next to last period because they know that they can't spend the money in the last period. And, and continuing this logic, you immediately conclude that no one will ever accept money for goods in a finite period model. Uh, so money has no value in a finite model. Uh, 
Now, of course, we can rescue this problem if we create a model where people live for an infinite number of periods. But there's a problem with that too, because of course, sadly, we don't live forever. Uh, so it seems that there's a, a serious tension between the requirements for, uh, for money and our, and our uh, biological finiteness. So uh, how, how do we resolve the tension? Uh, well, uh, the famous resolution uh, was made by Paul Samuelson. Wendy already mentioned Samuelson in connection with his foundations book. Uh, my favorite paper of, or work of Samuelson is his consumption loan model. Um, and in this model, people live for a finite number of periods, two, two periods to be exact, uh, but generations of people overlap. So that means that in every period, there are two generations. There's a, a young generation. They, they live in the current period and they'll also live in the next period. And then there's an old generation which lives in the current period and they were also around in the previous period. And the young, of course, are the productive ones. They're, they're the ones who, who, who create goods. Uh, they'll sell some of these goods to the old for money, and they're willing to take the old people's money because when they are old, the next period, they can spend it on goods then. And the old who are unproductive uh, have saved their money from when they were young so that they have some, so they, so they, so that they can get some uh, goods this period. So beautiful resolution of the conflict. And more than that, the, the model makes clear under what circumstances money can have value. First, there have to be overlapping generations. And second, there have to be at least some people who are willing to postpone or need to postpone some consumption to the future. So people are not consuming everything they produce immediately. Now, this of course is a, an especially brilliant model. Uh, we, we, we can't all be uh, Samuelson, but this is the sort of thing that I feel all economists should be able to do to some degree. That is to model at least some of their intuitions. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Eric. Uh, and uh, a very nice compliment to the previous pre presentations. Um, uh, and I will have to return to the question of, I mean, I think that you, your first question was so on target um, that it, econo good economics is both intuitions and models and being able to turn the one into the other. Uh, and uh, but um, uh, I'll, I'll start first by asking um, uh, the three of you, are, do you have comments or questions on the other? I'll then turn to the chat and there's some inter interesting questions there. I regret to say uh, that, um, uh, uh, that Pauline, uh, who actually is closer to Indonesia than any of us being in Australia, uh, has been unable to uh, come into the call. Uh, she may come in before we finish, but uh, right now she's just technically uh, not able. So um, are any of the three of you would like to comment or quite, Eric, Eric, go. So I, I enjoyed uh, Jean Paul's and, and Wendy's presentations very much. I, I, I have a question for Jean Paul. Uh, I haven't had a chance to uh, to read your interesting uh, approach uh, to uh, to the to the problem of polarization yet, but um, what wasn't clear to me from your presentation is what has changed in society to make uh, polarization or social stratification worse. You, 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 you describe the forces that would create this, but it's, it's pretty clear that 
things are worse now than they were several generations ago. Can you elaborate on that? Um, thanks, Eric. Yes, I think two things. First of all, this um, the selection of the elite based on education in the late twentieth century. Up, uh, this this is this is stronger. Um, and the second thing is this is part of a a transformation of society, um, which is about a, a you could think about it as the um, the development of individualism over time, or the kind of uh, disembedding of market behavior from um, society. And so a lot of the things that, um, uh, for example, just the meritocracy itself is an individualistic conception. Your, your merit is not based on your family or your birth or your ethnic group, or it's based on your individual effort. Now, if taking this to the extreme, we lose some of the social constraints on behavior. And so, and as people get atomized, we lose some of the communities that hold in check various, various forms of um, un unhealthy social behavior. And so this sorting effect can have a more um, pronounced effect on social outcomes because we're losing some of the um, some of the constraints, the behavioral constraints. So both the, the increase in economic mobility based on education, which is really sharply selecting, I think, based on these non-cognitive traits, such as self-control. And secondly, a lot of the social infrastructure that um, regulates behavior has, has, has been removed over time as in this kind of notion, this individualistic or atomized um, uh, lifestyles. Have um, have become much more pronounced. I will abuse my position as chair, John Paul. Uh, uh, that's a plausible argument, but obviously, in the 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 growth of individualism and the decline of other societal institutions has been going on. I mean, after all, this was the problem that Thomas Hobbes was uh, devoted himself mm -hmm. to in his two great two great works, Leviathan and the Citizen. It was exactly the way he was posing the problem. So this is not entirely a new phenomenon at all. And I, I'm, who knows if it, it has accelerated in recent uh, periods. Um, when, Wendy, can I, can I direct a question in the chat uh, uh, to you? Um, the, um, uh, um, Nihal Rodrigo has asked, um, uh, he said, uh, we're all saying that economics is uh, being taught to students is too narrow. I guess that must be you and uh, Jean-Paul. Um, uh, hence, it needs a revision. However, all, all there, are, there, there are hardly any textbooks that take into account the aspects that needs to be inbuilt in economics. Can you explain? Uh, maybe you could remark on that, uh, if it's true and why it would be true and what can be done about it. Yeah, so um, it, it is it is true of um, much of what is taught in um, in uh, e economics classes. Um, uh, it's it's interesting that there were there, the 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 idea that there was something wrong um, going on 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 inside classrooms and uh, came up particularly sharply in the wake of the financial crisis. So that that was the point at which. Um, uh, the, the, you know, the finger was really pointed at economists and uh, that, that, that said, uh, uh, you have nothing to say about the kind of instability that was that kind of gripped the economy in the financial crisis. Um, and so uh, that I think did lead to some genuine introspection. And uh, what was very striking was, was actually the mismatch between a lot of what had been going on in economics. So when I had those slides showing the, the kind of all the all the research that was being done on these uh, these questions, including instability, but it hadn't made its way into the classroom. Um, and one thing that's happened since the financial crisis is that um, economists uh, around the world have have put in a big effort to try and overcome that and to make available to uh, to students uh, all around the world the really the best of contemporary economics in a, in a form that uh, teaches economics, but uh, also connects with the, uh, the big societal problems that 
students identify. And maybe I can just quickly, Sam, could I just quickly spend a one minute showing me on the screen how people sure. can access this? Definitely. Okay, so. Share your screen, Wendy. So if you uh, just go to this uh, website, coricon.org, then you can find a whole wealth of textbook material that, that indeed addresses uh, these, these um, problems and it's all free. So just let me show you this textbook here. So it's available in, in many different languages. If we just pick the English language version and we go to the first, uh, to where the book begins, uh, it begins with this question of how, how capitalism revolution, revolutionized the way we live. It has uh, lots, of, um, lots of data. You can, you're directed immediately from the data to uh, go and, and see uh, an interactive version of the data. You can, uh, you can look at it in a different format. Uh, you can add countries that you're particularly interested in, uh, for example, um, and, and so on. So uh, this is a fantastic resource. There's, there's tons of um, material here that uh, will give you a very good taste. So for example, if we look here at the, uh, this section here on the firm owners, managers and employees, this is a way that you can learn about the, the principal agent relationship that uh, I was referring to as a way of thinking about the, um, uh, as, as a way of thinking about the labor market that's very different from two, two uh, lines crossing in a supply and demand diagram. So let me stop there, but encourage you to get onto the website. Everything is free and there's uh, lots of resources about understanding the pandemic um, as well as a new resource out two days ago on what's happened to financial regulation uh, in the years since the financial crisis. So it really shows economists have been hard at work and that we are producing material from research into the classroom, freely available um, to, to, for everyone to use. Eric, so, so I, I just wanted to comment or am amplify or uh, add a different take to, to what Wendy has just said. Going back to the financial crisis, uh, indeed economists were accused of having uh, nothing to say about the financial crisis, but actually I think that was a false criticism. Uh, there, there in fact was a wealth of uh, scholarly research going back to Diamond and Didvig in the, in the 1980s, including Kiyotaki and Moore, including Gina Kopoulos, which uh, explained the financial crisis uh, extremely well, how, how a, small, a small drop in wealth can lead to a massive uh, drop in uh, the, the ability of agents in the economy to get loans and therefore a massive drop in, in, in productivity. What, what uh, economists failed to do was to get th these important papers into the economics curriculum. And, and, and I think that's, that's what Wendy was saying. Uh, it wasn't that we didn't uh, have lots of ideas about the financial crisis, but it wasn't the central part of the curriculum. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, there's lots of action in the chat room and I'm, I'm gonna to come to that. Uh, I'll start by asking all of you a question that stems really from what Eric said. Um, the idea of being able to render one's uh, good intuitions in a model is really essential. And I think when I think of the kind of um, uh, PhD level education uh, that uh, we do, it's primarily teaching people how to model. Uh, and um, that's, it. And that's. I mean, I think I may have been the first person in the US to use problem sets in a microeconomics course. It was the advanced micro course at Harvard at the time. And uh, so that's what, what, what I was doing. I was essentially teaching people how to put their ideas into maps. But uh, I wonder what we do, which helps people to have good intuitions in the first place. 
Uh, now, what I did at the time was I was teaching essentially mathematical economics, but I had been a student of economic history. Uh, and I also was avid about uh, um, uh, uh, anthropology. And I think probably I got more ideas from studying economic history and anthropology than I did from studying economics. Um, but but I, I don't know how we can get the intuition generation into the process of how we train our students. But I, I want to turn to a question from, from uh, Danny Roderick, who's uh, with us. Hi, Danny. Um, uh, Danny asks, uh, this is asked to you, Eric, but anybody can chip in. Aren't models also useful to generate testable hypotheses that we might not have thought of beforehand and counterintuitive results that actually go against our intuitions? Anybody want, uh, Eric, you first, anyone else? Sure, sure. That, that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, uh, I, I listed three reasons why modeling is important, but of course it's not limited to three. And the models, of, of course, are, are, are valuable precisely because uh, they might be wrong, and, and, but we can't, we can't uh, test uh, our hypothesis until we've put it in sufficiently formal, uh, in, in a sufficiently formal way that we can uh, examine the data. To uh, to see whether it's right after all. Uh, great. Um, I want to add another question, but feel free, uh, Jean Paul and Wendy, also to, to uh, chip in on this. Uh, from uh, uh, from Chan uh, asks, um, time and attention is always scarce. If you want to add things, you need to cut other things. This is obviously a question for us. Uh, what things need to be dropped from the economist worldview or toolkit? Uh, and what needs to be cut from the economic syllabus? Uh, um, uh, Jean-Paul, do, do you have thoughts about that? I know Wendy has thoughts about it because Wendy has put together a curriculum, uh, a year-long intro course that's being taught in universities around the world. Uh, and obviously uh, she has put her money down on what she thinks should be in and obviously what is not in there. Uh, but um, uh, you may have something to say, Wendy, but first, Jean Paul, do, do you have thoughts about the things we spend too much time on that would make room for the kinds of social norms and evolutionary thinking that you have so uh, convincingly argued in favor of? That's a difficult question. I, I think um, your book, your microeconomics textbook does it very well, Sam, <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> but uh, well, it I, Flattery I will get you nowhere, Jean-Paul. You have to answer no, no, the question. It, yeah, it's, it's a difficult question, and I've thought about it, um, because I teach, uh, I taught the, um, you know, one-third of the first-year PhD micro uh, course at UC Irvine for some years um, before transitioning to Oxford, and um, the I introduced some uh, evolutionary lectures on um, the evolution of uh, norms and various other things, but it's difficult to cut out some of the core content because it's so essential to economics. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I struggle with that, and uh, I've left most of the standard content in there. I've added some um, lectures, uh, some at least uh, parts of lectures and whole lectures at the end of the course that provide kind of doorways into integrating the various kinds of um, social or political um, uh, dynamics that uh, I think should be integrated into, into this core. Um, but, and, and I follow that up in, in advanced courses. So that's the way I've done it at the moment. So for me, I found it very difficult to cut uh, any of the, uh, of the main material. Things like asymmetric information, adverse selection, these things, are, essential, these things are, are, are central to economics. And I don't think you can easily cut them. Um, let, me, let me just give a, uh, a, a look back. When Samuelson, Wendy said Samuelson uh, inverted the order of things, he did exactly that. Um, uh, in Samuelson's intro, uh, the, in 1948, uh, he dealt with uh, uh, macroeconomics first and then micro second. Uh, interestingly, the treatment of supply and demand comes on page 446. Uh, in the book, that's where he starts it. And 10 pages later, he says, that's all there is to the doctrine of supply and demand. It remains only 
to decide where it can be used and where it should not. And he goes on immediately to say, it cannot be used to study the aggregate labor market. Now, he had a pretty clear idea of what had to be cut back. In fact, he talks very articulately about his decisions about what to do and, uh, and, and what not. Um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, there's a question here, Wendy, um, uh, another question from Neil Rodrigo. He wants to know, is the core, is, is the thing you're describing, is it recommended or required in universities in the US or anywhere in the world now? Could you just uh, give a very brief answer to that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So briefly, it's being used in about, well, at least uh, 360, 370 universities in 60 countries. It's the, uh, the main textbook at, um, at some uh, leading universities. Uh, so Oxford, for example, um, Sciences Po, uh, the Toulouse School of Economics, uh, University College London. Um, it's going to be used at Princeton uh, in, from the spring. So it's being used all over the place. And you can see from the translations, say there's now a Spanish edition and it's being used in um, the, the uh, Carlos III and Pompeo in Spain. So it's kind of getting into the bloodstream in many, many uni universities um, around the world. And in, in actually, not just in the intro course, but it's, it's also being used uh, in uh, public policy master's courses, for example, uh, where, where an economics uh, course course is taught so uh yep there's there's hundreds of thousands of students who are being taught this way now um jean paul i, I have a question here in the chat um it's to you uh from uh and andy uh concoro um andy writes uh um you, uh, could you elaborate more on the static class-based model in your slide please in the previous panel penny suggests uh, a bigger size of the middle class and more intellectual global economy do you consider the static class-based model to be bad? Um, I don't know if it's bad or good, but the, the point there is that um, if you have selection um, into, into the elite or let's say high class or something like that, um, based on certain traits, uh, when, you, when you're, you're moving out of a caste-based society, these traits may be well mixed in the population. And so, um, there is a burst of initial economic mobility as people with the favorite traits in the non-elite start to get educated and start to enter the, 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 um, the elite, um, whereas those in the elite without the favorite traits drop down. Um, but this may be a temporary phenomenon. That was the point. Um, the, the idea is that the meritocracy is supposed to allow for this mobility and for allow for those uh, with favorite traits, regardless of their birth, to be able to um, to be able to express value, move into the elite, etc. But what happens though is, if you sort people initially in the initial generation as you're moving out of a caste-based society, and then those traits are perpetuated within classes through some form of cultural transmission through schools, through families, etc. And what happens is in the next generation, when you're going to do the selection, well, all of the people with the favorite traits are already in the elite. They're the children of the elite. Uh, or they're much more likely to have those traits. And so therefore, the mobility in the next generation is very limited. And so then you have a class-based class -based society. It's not a caste-based society where it's prescribed by social convention that because of your birth, you have, to, um, you have a particular social position or occupation. But... You, you, a mobility is allowed, but nevertheless, it is uh, the society is ossified. So I don't know if it's bad or good, but this is it's, the point: is that the um, the mobility may only be temporary. Okay, we have we have uh, two or three minutes remaining. Um, there's a request here that the speakers could make available their slides. Uh, Erica said fine, uh, and. Uh, um, Jean-Paul and Wendy, uh, do I take it that it's okay with you? Uh, so anybody, uh, you can find them, I'm sure, and, and send them a request, or maybe IEA will find a way to distribute them. Uh, to the three of you, uh, stepping back, uh, is there, uh, do you have a, um, uh, a few remarks you'd like to make about the, the question, what should an economist know? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you, uh, Wendy. Um, yeah, well, mine, mine is rather uh, not a statement so much as a question. So I'd really love to know uh, Eric's answer to the question. So 
um, uh, it, I think it's 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 fascinating to think about the role of learning how to model in the education of an economist. But I, I'd also just love to hear you, you know your little kind of soundbite on um, what you think an economist should know. So, uh, so you are you're you're asking me. Uh, well, yeah. Sam talks about having set uh, problem sets in, in micro. And of course, uh, <clears throat> that's one way of teaching students how to model. Uh, we, we've been doing something uh, analogous at Harvard, which actually has worked pretty well. And in, in, in the first year class, uh, we, um, we find newspaper passages uh, about, say, uh, what has happened to uh, rent control in, uh, in New York City, or what has happened to uh, pollution control in Los Angeles. And we have asked our students, well, are, 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 they, uh, are the prescriptions here, uh, do they make economic sense? Uh, construct a little model in, in which you can evaluate uh, what the, the journalist or the op-ed writer uh, has said about rent control and, and pollution control. Uh, students find that hard. Uh, it, 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 it's a challenge to make the leap from, uh, from journalism to, to models, but, but uh, I think in retrospect, they, they're glad they went through that particular kind of boot camp. You, your students are very lucky to have you, Eric. It's a wonderful innovation. Jean-Paul. I, I, I don't do it myself, I have to admit. I, Ed, well, Ed Glazer uh, in our department it has been in charge of that unit. I'm not surprised. Uh, congratulations to him as well. Jean-Paul, take it on home. Okay. Um, I, I want to reiterate a couple of points that have been made. Uh, the study, I think, of, of history, economic and social history is very important. Um, as Sam mentioned, the, the, the two, the two, my two fields in graduate school were um, uh, microeconomic theory and economic history. And uh, I think I've, I've greatly benefited from the historical side in terms of a broader understanding of things and understanding that uh, the economic and social phenomena cannot be kind of decoupled in a particular way. Um, in terms of integrating it, I think it's really about, it's difficult to eliminate some of the, the corpus of economics um, it's really about integrating um, these broader um, notions and phenomena into the existing syllabus. And there's two things. One is that um, look at the, the, the tools that we use can be applied very broadly. Look at signaling models, right? From gang markers to conspicuous consumption to um, all kinds of things, right? Um, and, uh, but also I think we need to introduce a more boundedly rational approach where, individual, where agents are learning from each other and gripping their way to some equilibrium or maybe disequilibrium. And uh, this, this needs to be um, uh, integrated into economics as Wendy uh, was talking about um, based on her work with Sam as well. So yeah. thanks, thanks very much. Thanks for our participants for joining us. Sorry we couldn't see you. Thanks for your questions. Uh, thanks, Eric, Wendy, Jean-Paul. Wonderful conversation. Thanks. We'll continue it uh, in other ways. Bye for now. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.